All right. Praise God. We've got a little series going on uh, called The Perfect Little Prayer. And last week, you remember, we uh, began on the Lord's Prayer. And uh, we also call it our prayer, or you can call it the Disciples' Prayer, because technically it's the prayer that He gave us to pray. Uh, not that He didn't pray that prayer or some uh, those things in the prayer, except for He definitely didn't pray, Father, forgive us our sins. Amen. That would be the one thing I thought about that he wouldn't pray because he is sinless. Amen. But the other aspects of that prayer, uh, you know, are, are very befitting uh, and probably very similar to a lot of the things that he prayed. And one reason I call it the perfect little prayer is because Jesus gave it on two different occasions. I mentioned that last time as he gave it in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, and in the midst of this incredible teaching, he instructs him on how to pray. But later in his ministry, they ask him again, you know, teach us how to pray. Uh, teach us how to preach. Uh, teach us how to, you know, be a good family members and what have you. But teach us how to pray. And those other things can, are very important. Those other aspects of the life that he calls us to live. But he understood and they understood that his power and who he was came from his relationship and intimacy with his father. They didn't understand all of his mission at that point, but they understood that, wow, there's a connection between him getting up early in the morning, him seeking the face of the Father, and the walking on the water, and casting out demons, and healing the sick, and raising the dead. There's some connection there, you know? So they said, teach us how to pray. And then he basically gave them the same prayer, you know? That's in Luke 11. You see it the second time. And it's almost the same. I mean, it's, there's a couple words here and there different, and which shows you there's a little bit of liberty there as far as the prayer is more of a model you know, you don't have to get the exact words right because it's, he's not impressed by, you know, how well you say a certain word. He wants your heart, and he's basically outlining the needs of the kingdom and that we need to be involved in and the priorities of the kingdom that we need to be seeking in that prayer. I'll pray that prayer, and I'll change up the words. You know, if I'm praying, you know, with my little boy, a lot of times I'll say, as I mentioned before, when, when get to hallowed be thy name, you know, Hallowed means to ascribe holiness to his name. His name is his nature, you see, his person. So I'll, I'll say, you know, God, Father in heaven, you know, help me to glorify, help, you know, Josiah and I or Heather and I, and, you know, to, to glorify your name or Holly and help us to bring glory to your name and help our lives to show who you are. As we talked about last week, the angels in heaven, you know, uh, the seraphim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I mean, they have these six wings. You remember we talked about that? And two, they cover the face. Two, they cover their feet. But two, they fly with. And they're constantly saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they're ascribing holiness to God. So when you look at those angels, what are you thinking? Whoa, man. Their eyes are, you know, covered because they're in the very presence of God. And the creator that created the universe, this, this universe is just beyond our understanding. It's so radical. And so powerful that if you got in your, his presence, you'd be doing something like, you won't, you know, got the wings and stuff going on, but you'd be on your face. In heaven, they're on their knees at times. They're cast their crowns, even after they've been crowned because of their rewards. They cast their crowns before the throne of God and ascribe holiness to God. And that's what we're supposed to be doing here in our lives. We're supposed to be praying that our lives would be that way. And we talked about how he's our father, our father, right, who art in heaven. And he, he's, there's a relationship. We must be born again. Jesus said, you, Jesus Christ said, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God, right? So we're born again in the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And we now have a relationship with the Father. And the Hebrew word for Father is Abba, which I think is interesting because linguists have found, some linguists uh, uh, determined in a study that the most common word said by infants is Abba. Kind of interesting, huh? Abba. In fact, it's a Hebrew word for father. In fact, they found that it's the first word of all the other words that children usually speak, infants usually say is Abba. Kind of interesting. And here we are called to have a relationship with our Abba Father. And we're called to be like children, enter the kingdom of God. Children rely, you know, rely on their parents. They don't even give much thought, right? But all of a sudden they feel the parent has to provide and, and, and give, give them sustenance and, and will and they trust. We're supposed to be trusting God and be like children and trust Him for our lives. Give us this day our daily bread. So it's a perfect little prayer because it came from our perfect Lord and Savior, from His mouth, two different times. Once would have been enough, as I said last time, but twice there's an emphasis that this is a very, very important prayer. And I think you and I need to really, 
realize how important this is, especially in the light of the times that we're facing. We need to recognize its importance, but we need to recognize its importance in the day and age when the Bible mentions that there's a great tribulation coming up, that our country is facing a recession uh, that some have predicted could be worse than the Great Depression. And, uh, you know, the stimulus package, which uh, the Democrats are, are betting on, you know, uh, doesn't work. And the Republicans, who almost every one of them didn't vote on, I think except, except three or something like that, and they're right, we're going to get in worse trouble, depending, you know, either way, I mean, you, can't, you have to trust God. And it doesn't matter, ultimately, with regard to what happens with the stimulus package that was just passed this last week and what have you, because ultimately we know what the Bible says about how things will get worse. And how there will be, Jesus said, famines on the earth. And in the book of Revelation, those famines, people, you know, hold, you know, parts of the earth are just devastated with famine. And we need to recognize that part of this prayer is praying that God would give us this day our what? Daily bread. So this prayer becomes even more and more significant to people, should be right now, as they start to go through hard times. And so as we look at these passages, uh, another reason I think this prayer is perfect is because of the number seven. Seven is the number of what in the Bible? Number what? Perfection, completion. It's the number of completion. And I think it's interesting because uh, from the very first book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, Genesis is the Greek word for beginnings, you, you have that established already. You see, you'll see that the word seven, or I'm sorry, the number uh, of days that God gives for a week is what? Seven. And most, you know, uh, progressive nations, and it's kind of, uh, have a seven-day week. And anthropologists don't understand it. For a year, for, for uh, thousands of years, there's been all kinds of seven-day weeks all over the planet. But there's nothing that would make you go outside and say, hey, the week should be seven days long. But it shows you that there is this, you know, spiritual amnesia today as to the beginning, but that there was, the, that at the Tower of Babel, people were divided. And so there's seven-day weeks all over the planet. It's kind of interesting. But God gave a seven-day week as a complete week. The next day, you know, uh, at the end of the week was the first day of the next week. And so seven was a, a complete week. And it's interesting because the word creation is used seven times in the creation narrative in the book of Genesis, in the first uh, couple chapters. So I think it's interesting also when Noah, in the book of Genesis, uh, took animals under the ark, he was called to take seven of certain, what, clean animals for what? Sacrifice. Because the sacrifices in the Old Testament were a picture of what? Of Jesus' sacrifice. It was a perfect sacrifice. So you had to take seven, which was a number of completion, pointing to the Lord Jesus. Also, when Job's friends, or who his counselors, who kind of accused him because he was really, really going through really hard times, really sick, and they thought, ah, oh, he must have sinned. He must have done something wrong. And they started accusing him falsely, not knowing and just jumping to conclusions because their idea was, well, if you're really this bad off, you must be getting judged by God. And they were all messed up. They didn't understand that God was giving, allowing him to go through a trial and was perfecting him and making him like gold. And God does those kinds of things. And at the end, God spoke against them. And Job ended up bringing seven bullocks, you see, uh, for sacrifice as well, and seven rams. Again, seven of each, which is, again, a picture of the ultimate sacrifice for us of the Lord Jesus. So throughout the Scripture, there were seven years of famine, you remember, in Egypt, in Joseph's time, there were seven feast days when you go through the book of Exodus that were given by the Lord. Seven different feast days. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, the day of atonement, day of, Prophets, day of tabernacles, or feast of booths. Uh, also, Israel, how many times were they called to march around Jericho before it came down? Seven times, right? Seven times they marched around the city and it was on the seventh day, right, that Jericho came down. And that, you know, the trumpets blew, and that was a picture of the Lord's return at the second coming, which will be at what trumpet? The seventh trumpet. Read Revelation chapter 11. So it's interesting, we see this. Naaman, who was a leper, and leprosy is a picture of sin. How many times was uh, Naaman uh, told to uh, dip in the Jordan River? Seven times. There it is again. How many, some of you knew that answer, huh? You better, man. <laughs> uh, how many years did Solomon take him to? build the temple seven years you know seven years and uh the menorah in the temple how many how many branches 
Seven, there it is again, over and over again, which is a complete light, a picture of, of the light of God. And it's interesting because the mercy seat in the temple, which is where the blood of the sacrifice was to be, how many times was a priest supposed to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat? Seven times. There it is again. This is an easy test, huh? You keep getting it right, you know? <laughs> Praise God. Uh, Jerusalem was in captivity. Don't say seven. That's a trick question. I'd be embarrassed. Seventy years. So sometimes there's multiples of seven. Like, for instance, when uh, Jesus said, forgive if your brother sins against you seven times in a day. Forgive him seven times in a day. And Peter, like, well, man, can I, is there, can I still have a limit? He's not getting it, meaning keep forgiving. Be, you know, complete. You know, have a, have a perfect heart toward people. So Peter says, uh, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? Up to seven times? Later on, he says this. Jesus said, not seven times. Seventy times seven. You know, 490, but it's a multiples of seven, which, again, is a number of completion. And it's interesting because the Bible was written over a 1,500-year period, right, by over 40 different authors that God used in Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek, three different languages, you know, and from everything from fishermen to tax gatherers to King David, and, and it's one integral message. You could not do that if you took three people today and put one in, in New York and one in Miami and one in L.A. and told them to write on the same subject and put the books together. You would have just a contradiction, a full of mess, but in the Bible, man, it's one whole. The book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, there's there's a code from God from that he's revealed to us, and seven is a number that he uses continually. It's used you know, hundreds of times in the Scripture, over 500 times, and then it gets even bigger when you look at sevenfold and 70 and what have you. So we get this over and over again uh, throughout of the Scripture. Uh, now, I think it's interesting as well because the Bible talks about the end times in the book of Revelation, the number seven, and that book alone is used over 50 times. The tribulation period is how long? The 70th week of Daniel. Daniel is told there's 70 weeks, right? And 69 weeks until the Messiah would come, but then there would be a final week later on at the end of time. In the middle of that week, seven, and by the way, the Hebrew word that's translated week in Daniel chapter 9 in most translation is literally a Hebrew word that means seven, quite literally. The word actually means a seven. You see, and there's a final seven to be fulfilled. And in the middle of the seven, the Antichrist breaks the covenant that he's made with Israel and nations, and he, and he turns on Israel, and he sits in the temple of God, shows himself that he is God. Then there's three and a half more years, which we call the Great Tribulation Period. So we speak of Daniel's 70th week, the last seven years. In the middle of the week is the, the beginning of the Great Tribulation, which is the last three and a half years, because that's when the Antichrist persecutes uh, the Jews and persecutes Christians and what have you. And that, I believe, is not too far away. I mean, things, everything like what the Scripture is talking about is coming together, whether it's the Middle East situation and what's happening here in our country as we buddy up uh, more and more with, because we want oil and because, you know, we are going into recession. We'll turn our back, I believe, eventually on Israel, personally. That the Bible says every nation will gather against Israel to destroy it. And that's when the Lord uh, Jesus Christ will return and set his feet on the Mount of Olives. So it says in that 70th week, it'll be 70 weeks until, or 77s, it says, and to bring an end to sin and bring in everlasting righteousness. You see, you got the 77s to bring a consummation of the ages and the end of, of course, that last seven, which I've spoke about. But in the book of Revelation, it's amazing. It says, you know, in, in the final book, the last book, we talked about the sevens at the beginning of Genesis, right? Seven days and you know, seven clean animals, and then you go to the book of Revelation, and it's amazing because, and some of you were in our study in the book of Revelation, which we had on a midweek study for, I think it was seven years, you know, that wasn't planned that way, you know, and, and maybe the Lord said, Joe, I want it done in four years, but hey, you know, but hey, it just lasted seven years, that was pretty cool, but you'll notice we, you know, the number seven kept coming up, uh, there are seven stars in the hand of the Lord Jesus, rep represent the seven angels of the seven churches or the seven messengers of the seven churches uh there are seven uh, uh those seven stars are seven horns on the lamb lamb is jesus he's having a vision of jesus and those seven uh horns it says it says are the seven spirits of god which are gone out into all the earth kind of a picture it's interesting because the menorah those seven flames it says he makes his angels flames of fire and you see seven angels revelation chapter 8 verse 1 and it says also, uh, his angels are ministering spirits. Revelation 8, 1, you see seven angels standing before the throne of God, you see. And Jesus the, addresses the book of Revelation to the seven churches. It's in Revelation 1, 4, 
Also, I mean, then you see all seven churches being specifically addressed in Revelation 2 and 3. And it's interesting, why those seven churches? Because I believe the problems and the strengths of those various churches were a picture of how the church is throughout the ages. I'm not saying that each church represents 150 or 200 years like many people do know. These are the things that are, he says. Okay, but in those churches, you see the same problems going on today that need to be addressed. So he gives us a kind of a perfect picture in the seven churches. And then he says at the end of each one, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So I think it's important to understand that throughout Revelation, you also see, you know, there's seven thunders, there's seven seals, seven trumpets. You remember that? Seven bowl judgments. Uh, you know, and on and on and on, we see these uh, seven, the seven thunders out of their voices. And that's the place where God tells, the Lord has the servant tell John not to write that down. But it's interesting, at the end of some of the sevens, you see the end of the age. In fact, in Revelation 10, 7, it says, when the seventh angel begins to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished. It'll be finished. That he's declared to his servants the prophets. By the way, speaking of being finished, Jesus on the cross said, it is what? Finished. And how many saints did Jesus have from the cross? Go back and read the Gospels. Seven saints. There were seven saints from the cross, including it is finished, because it was a finished work of the perfect sacrifice. I don't know how somebody can't believe the Bible after they study it, man. It's way beyond us, way beyond anything anybody could just put together. And we have the historical documents that represent, better attested to of any, uh, any ancient writing is the Bible. And so we get all these sevens, and at the end of this, it's a, he says, in the days of the voice of the seventh trumpet, when she shall blow, he says, the mystery of God shall be finished. And then when you go to the seventh trumpet, Revelation 11, 15 through 19, the seventh trumpet blows, and guess what? Boom. He, Jesus reigns. He, he who was and is comes. It's no longer him who was and is and is to come, but him who was and is, he's called. Earlier, it's him who was and is and is to come. He comes, and he begins to reign, and his wrath comes on the nations. It's the time to reward the saints takes place, it says. And it's a picture of the end. You see, the seals bring you to the end. You look at the uh, sixth seal and the seventh seal. The sixth seal basically brings you to the end, but the seventh seal shows you what it's more open in the seal, so you see what happened in more detail. Seventh trumpet brings in, by the way, the seventh bowl, you know what it says the seventh bowl? The seventh bowl is the last judgment uh, specifically mentioned as far as the series of judgments, and it says, uh, regarding the seventh bowl, it says, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. It is what? Done. It brings the end, you guys. So again and again, uh, we see this, and there's all kinds of wonderful, really wonderful uh, things in the scriptures and revelation even that of sevens, you know, like seven beatitudes. I mean, you know, blessed is he that keeps his garments, you know, and stays awake, so, you know, he shall, you know, because he, you need to be ready for Jesus' return in Revelation 16, 15. The very first beatitude in Revelation is chapter 1, verse 3, you know, blessed is he that, re you know, heareth, and, you know, the words of this prophecy, Right? And, and reads, it says first, blessed is he that reads and hears the words of prophecy and keeps those things which are written therein. Wow. So you're blessed when you study the book of Revelation. Contrary to some people, oh, I don't want to read that book. Wait, that's the one book that God starts off by saying you're blessed if you read it. It's a revelation, not an obscurity. You know, it's not an obscure book. Oh, there's hard things to understand, but it's to reveal to those who have ears to hear and want to know God. And it shows us what's going on. So there's the seven Beatitudes, there's seven new things, and on and on and on. Well, why do I emphasize seven? Why do we spend eight minutes or whatever it just was talking about the number seven from Genesis to Revelation? Well, hopefully to build your faith up a little bit, like, wow, you know, look at God, man. Look what he's doing. But also, and more so, because there are seven specific petitions in the perfect prayer. Seven specific petitions. And I want you to understand how perfect this prayer is that cover every area of life, that cover our, our spirituality, you know, the, the, you know, cover our practical needs. It covers everything. The first uh, petition is regarding God's person. Remember, hallowed be thy name. We studied that last week, that his name, his person would be hallowed by us. I mentioned it earlier in this message as well. So the first petition is, about his our relationship with him and jesus said in that same message same sermon i should say seek ye first what the kingdom of god and his righteousness 
So the prayer starts with our, us, seeking who? The Father, and desiring to give him glory. You see, it starts in the right place. It's not like Maslow's uh, psychological chart where everything's backwards, you know, physical needs first and spiritual needs last. That's backwards. That's why the world's messed up, you know. Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all your needs would be met. Could you imagine if the guys on Wall Street, Main Street, were seeking God first, and, uh, and everybody in the president and his cabinet were on their knees in prayer together, saying, your will be done, God? I think the stimulus package would be a bit different. I think Wall Street would be a bit different, you know? Things would be way different in this country, and we'd be taken care of. But it's because we are so greedy in our nation. You know, there are a lot of CEOs that are greedy, and there are a lot, you know, there's a lot of bankers that are greedy, and there's a lot of politicians that are greedy and are concerned about lobbyists and, and, you know, concerned about special interests and all these different things. But we're called to seek first the kingdom of God. Amen? We need to rely on him. We need to not make sure we don't rely on government as though it's God. And that's very, very important in the days that we live, guys. You can't put your trust in man. I've shared that verse with you on a couple occasions in the past that we're warned not to put our trust in princes. Amen? That's, in the, those days, those were politicians. We're called to put our trust in the one and true living God. And the Bible says, curse is the one who puts his trust in man. So we need to be very, very careful uh, because days of famine are coming. In fact, look at Revelation chapter 6. And the reason I mention this to you, and if you will, can you please put your finger in Revelation 6, and then also put your finger in, or, you know, you might have left there, but it's pretty easy to find. Go back to Matthew chapter 6, if you're not there, if you, if you left there like I did. Go back to Matthew chapter 6, and I want you to see something very, very important. Very, very important. In Matthew chapter 6, you, you, you know, you read our Father who art in heaven and the, the Lord's Prayer. But it's interesting because, uh, look at it again. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? So we have, we have, first of all, the preeminence of the Father, right? Thy kingdom come, right? Then what do we have? Number two, we don't have just the, God's preeminence, we have God's what? We, we have, well, first of all, I'm sorry, number one, we have God's person, that would be hallowed, right? Then we have the preeminence of God's kingdom. After we say, our Father, may, you know, I make your name hallowed, may I glorify your name, we're praying what? Thy kingdom come. The preeminence of God's kingdom. It's, it's first, man. Seeking first the kingdom of God. Then number three, what do we have? God's purpose. We have God's purpose. Number three, we have God's purpose. Because number two is his preeminence, your kingdom come. But the next part of that verse is God's purpose. Your what? Your will be done. You see, we want to make sure we have fulfilled and we're fulfilling God's purpose. Every one of us was created to fulfill God's purpose, which is to bring him glory and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and live for God and seek his kingdom and, and glorify him. Amen? So that's the third part of his will. We talked about those three first uh, things in this seven petitions last week. His person, we talked about his preeminence, his kingdom, and his purpose, his will. What's the next thing, number four? The next thing is God's what? Provision. God's provision. Amen. So your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. The next one, number four, which is right in the middle of the prayer, as far as the petitions go. Give us this day your what? Give us this day what? Our daily bread. Give. What do babies do when they say Abba? What's another word they learn pretty soon? Gimme, gimme, right? Because we're needy. You know, we weren't meant to be islands unto ourselves, self-sustained. And God wants us to depend on him. He's the great giver. He says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He says the earth and the fullness thereof belongs to him. He owns everything, guys. doesn't matter what any government says. God owns the earth, okay? The world system is run by Satan, the Bible says. He's the prince of the power of the air, the, the ruler of the world system. But this is God's earth, okay? He made it. The world's given itself over to Satan, and they've subjected himself to his mastery. God's calling people out of that kingdom into his kingdom. So God says we're supposed to pray Seek him as, his, as our father, and we're supposed to tell him, you know, give us this day our daily bread. We're supposed to depend on him for our daily bread. And then, you know, next there's, you know, God pardon, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And then number six, uh, you know, you have uh, God's precaution where he, you know, lead us not into temptation. And then number seven, you have God's protection, deliver us from evil. 
But today we want to talk about uh, him, his daily bread. His daily bread. Give us this day our daily, our daily bread. Give us this day our, notice again, our daily bread. There's no what? Personal pronouns in the Lord's Prayer or our prayer or the disciples' prayer, whatever you want to call it. There's plural pronouns because it's not about me. It's about God and then his kingdom, which is us. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread. Bread. It's a symbol of sustenance. It, uh, the, the term bread was used through, and is used in scripture uh, uh, for food in general, for God meeting our needs. You know, it can be used in the broad practical sense of God, simply uh, meeting our needs. But go to Revelation chapter 6 and look what's going to happen on the earth when the four horsemen of the apocalypse come trampling down. The Bible talks about the, the, the four horsemen uh, that begin the tribulation period. And he said in verse 1, Then I saw, or then when I saw the Lamb, he broke the seven seals. Remember, there's a seven-sealed scroll that Jesus gets from the Father in heaven. And, and he said, And I heard one of the four living creatures saying, As with a voice of thunder come, I looked, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. And by the way, Math, Revelation chapter 6 parallels Matthew chapter 24. And it brings you through the tribulation period in, in, in an outline sketch. In fact, from chapter uh, 6, verse 1, into the end of the book of or this particular chapter, you can go through an outline and diagram it and parallel it with the uh, book of, uh, of Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, when Jesus talked about the end times. The book of Revelation is many different snapshots of the end, sometimes an entire perusal with not a ton of detail, and then other details given in other, uh, other visions. But they give you little pieces of the picture. And all you have to do is start studying it and reading it. And you become conversant with it. It's, it. it's not as hard to understand as people would have you think. So right here, this parallels Matthew chapter 24, where what begins false Christ and false prophets. You know, the, the angel of light, so to speak, deception. And notice that this conquer comes at the beginning of the tribulation period to conquer, you see. And the Bible tells us it's, it's, it's the Antichrist who will sign a covenant for seven years. And he'll destroy many in the name of peace. He'll say it's for peace. See? And, you know, he'll come against, you know, those who trust God. And he'll make himself God, the scriptures say. And uh, he had the voice of, a voice of thunder. And he said, come. And then verse 2, I looked and behold a white horse. And he who uh, was on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another red horse went out. And for him, was, and he who sat on it was granted to take peace from the earth. And that men would slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. A great sword, man. Sword's a symbol of destructive power here. And man, is there destructive power on the earth? Great destructive power like never before, guys? No doubt about it, man. Nuclear bombs, you know? I mean, we're talking about in the, in the Bible, and it says when, uh, you know, when Israel is surrounded by various nations, she'll be like a pot of fire in, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, she'll be like a flaming pot, you know, and, and she'll consume all the people around her, all the, na all the nations around her, just be consumed. And it says in Revelation 14, while they're standing on their feet, what? Their eyes will be dissolved out of their sockets, man. It says that. Their tongues will be dissolved out of their mouths, and their, and their flesh will be dissolved from their, while they're standing up. There were no weapons like that back then, were there? Come on, son. Well, that, no, there weren't. Today there are. Today there's weapons like neutron bombs that just dissolve your flesh while you're standing up. And the Bible says it's going to happen at the end as all the world gets, goes together against Israel at Armageddon. Okay, heavy stuff. But right now there's going to be war that leads up to that as the Antichrist uh, begins to uh, you know, bring forth his kingdom and apply it to the earth. Verse 5. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. What comes after war so often? Famine, guys. And there's a pair of scales in his hand. Why? And I heard something like a voice of the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Oh, he's going to let them have some oil and wine. And, and still, hey, you're going to have some of your luxuries in the world in the end. But guess what? Your food's going. A denarius is a day's wages in biblical times. 
A quart of wheat? What was that? For a day's wages, man. It would take a whole day's wages, guys. Take a whole day's wages to get a quart of wheat. Oh, you can get three quarts of barley. You can get more barley, but barley is horse food, okay? So the dog food will get a better price on, you know, during the tribulation period. Hey, we need to be aware that this prayer, give us this day our daily bread, is so important. Because David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. The neat thing is that we could trust God when things go down. And we're going to get into some scriptures that talk about that. Because our hearts need to be prepared for right now, spiritually, right? I mean, there's a lot of places on the earth where people are starving where you need to be in prayer and seeking God. And if you seek first the kingdom of God as righteous, Jesus said he'll meet our needs, amen? But guess what? In the tribulation period, you really need to be seeking the Lord as well. And that word, those words right there, if we go through the tribulation in our lifetime, you know, it could happen in our lifetime. It could happen in generations to come. Can't say exactly when, but you know what? We always need to be aware of what the Bible says about the future, especially when things are happening in such a way right now. Even if, you know, we don't go into that period, we can, our country is in a lot of danger right now. And we need to be praying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You know, your kingdom come, your will be done, not man's kingdom, you know. And give us this day what? Our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. It's a, it's a perfect prayer, and it covers our, our, our practical needs as well. And there's those scales there. That's a, that's a sign right there, man, showing us what is coming up. You can't put your trust, as I mentioned earlier, in government, because what happens is government tries to replace God often. Government was not meant, government was not meant to meet everybody's needs. It can't, because people are corrupt, and people play favorites. And there's no perfect government on the human earth. Government was instituted by God, according to Romans chapter 13, to protect the citizenry from evil. That's why almost you know, every, government, every nation has got a government. And the government should be protecting its people from evil. You don't have any kind of government and you just, you just have anarchy. So you need human government for there to be some semblance of, 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 some semblance of peace on, in, in nations. But what happens is a government moves from its role of protecting the people from evil, right, to playing the place of God. And then stealing money from some people in the name of taxes. I'm not saying taxes are wrong, but sometimes government in the name of taxes will take money from Frank to give to Bill. You know, and then Frank might face a hardship and that money isn't there for Frank and Bill's not working. And he doesn't want to work. And that's when it becomes theft. When Because the Bible says, if man isn't work, don't let him eat. Obviously, if someone can't work, there's a different situation. But if a man is refusing to work, so what happens is there becomes a terrible imbalance. I'm not saying I'm, I'm all for helping the poor. You know, voluntarily, we help the poor in this fellowship. That's one of our priorities as a fellowship is to reach out and help people. But it's not government's role to play God. I'm not saying there's not a place for the government to intervene and help. They should. But as far as being the end all and putting themselves in the place of God and saying where you can't worship and where you can worship and it's saying you know, how you have to live life and then, and then eventually you have to worship the system above God. Because what happens is when in our country, I mean, I almost brought it today. I have a copy of Newsweek that its front cover says we're all socialists now. That's what it says in the front cover. And it, because our country is moving towards socialism. You say, yeah, that Barack Obama. Well, pfft. President Bush, you know, just before his term was over. He didn't use the term New World Order like, this, like King George I did, you know, 20 times. But guess what? Just before he got out of office, he basically made a strong move to nationalize the banks. Which means, guess what? The banks now own, I'm sorry, the government now owns a ton of houses. They own the houses that those banks own. Until those debts are paid back. And government grows, and then through the stimulus package, there's a reach into health care and more into education and everything else. And, and what happens and the concern is by many Americans who we've been founded this nation on the Constitution is that there will be a constitutional convention possibly in the future and things will be changed so radically where this won't even, this instead of being the USA, you know, will be like the USSR, it will be the USSA, you know, 
the United Socialist States of America. And you look at what happens to socialist states in time. Look at North Korea. You know, look at the USSR, right? What's the Union of Socialist States, you know, uh, or, of the Soviet Union, right? Soviet Republic. It, it's, it's socialist states. That's in the name. And what happened? It was one of the most repressive regimes ever. You couldn't worship God. Stalin killed almost 60 million by himself. Look at China today. today. Very oppressive. Look at North Korea. Have you seen what went on in North Korea? You know? I mean, you don't want the government to, to, you know, and right here we're, you know, in a democracy where you can vote, where the problem is, is people say, oh, I get this for free. Oh, I get this for free. Now, it's not a price. It's not for free because you got to pay the piper, man. And the government gets more and more control over your life. Before you know it, you lose the cherished liberties that you've had. And what happens with us as Christians, we need to obey the government unless it contradicts God's word. Amen. So we need to be good citizens. Of course, we're told to take the mark of the beast. No way. Amen. There's lines. And we need to be good citizens, and we need to respect authority as well, the position. But at the same time, we need to be wise about recognizing that you don't want to get complacent and put government as though that's God. Because what's happened in our country, number one, because we're a very rich country, and number two, because government's growing, is we have a kind of a smugness in our heart that we don't need God. Remember Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle? Remember that? Why? Because a rich person thinks, I don't need God. I don't need God. And remember that guy that kept storing up all of his stuff into a barn? And then he died? And God says, you fool. Today your soul is required of you. So you can't rely even if you think you have a ton of stuff. Because you need God every day. And God would call you a fool at the end of your life. Because you didn't put your trust in him. And you need to. So what happens here is, guess what? We're all rich for the most part in America. I mean, compared to when Jesus talked about the rich in those days, harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a, a rich man the, uh, to get in the kingdom is a camel than the eye of a needle. More, you know, harder than that? Harder than the camel? Yeah, because they were self-sufficient. Guess what? We're richer than almost all the rich people. The average person in America is richer than almost everybody that lived in, uh, in that culture. As far as none of them had cars. If you saw how they lived, the rich, you'd say, God, poor, poor guy. You know, well, at least he's got some farmland. You would think he was poor today, maybe. Okay, we're rich, comparably. So we have to watch out because why do I have to pray, give us this day our daily bread? I got plenty of food. I got a refrigerator filled with food. I've got, you know, because guess what? The Bible says riches are like a bird that has wings and just flies away. Anybody find that out with money when you have a little bit of money and all of a sudden, where'd it go? Just like that, you know. You gotta, you gotta put your trust in God. You can have, well, uh, Joe, pff, believe me, I've got so much stored up. That guy lost everything after he stored it up. And he stood before God. Right after, and you know what? He didn't even store it up. He just made the plan. I've got, you know, I'm gonna fill my barns. Boom. You have to rely on God. He wants us to make sure that we are relying on Him and not relying on government. Winston Churchill, by the way, speaking of socialism, what do you think Nazism was? You know, national socialism. Think about it. But wait, well, Hitler was really evil. Ah, they didn't think that. Not at first. Because guess what? Hitler, uh, under his regime, you know, providing everybody a Volkswagen. Volks in Germany is people. People's car. He's for the people. I want to have everybody get a car. Oh, and the Hitler houses. I'm going to take the money, you know, and give it to, and make Hitler houses. So he'd go into the poor communities, you know, and, the, and he'd make Hitler houses. Every community, he'd go to a house, he'd make, give, build houses for the poor with the tax money. And everybody was, he was a hero in the town. Wow, how benevolent, how good. Hitler's the answer. National socialism's the answer. Getting back to nature, the dirt, you know, worshiping the environment, you know. Wow, sound familiar? And then guess what happened? Before you know it, millions of Jews are dead. And Christians. He killed maybe five, six million Christians as well. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. So we need to make sure we are seeking the Lord. Uh, Winston Churchill, who helped defeat, he was the leader of England, who along with you know, our country and the allies defeated 
uh, Germany. You know what Winston Churchill said about socialism? He said, socialism is a philosophy of failure, the creed of ignorance, and the gospel of envy. That's pretty heavy. It inherits, uh, or it, its inherent virtue is the equal sharing of misery. That's pretty powerful, man. Wow, and he's, he defeated the socialists. And, you know, we have to be careful because, you know, the whole world will one day unite under a new world order, as we know. So you can't ultimately, you need to pray for your leaders. You need to respect their authority, okay? But you need to make sure you're not putting your trust in leadership. Pray for Barack Obama. You're commanded to pray for that guy. You are. Paul, Paul commanded us to pray for leaders in his day, the, the believers, in their, and the leader was Nero, you know? The Romans put Jesus on the cross and Nero took Paul's head, but he called for prayer for him. So we need to be praying for our leaders, but we need to be wise. And we need to be seeking our Father to meet our needs. Amen? So we need to have a biblical balance there, a uh, scriptural balance. And it's interesting. He's give us this day our what? Daily bread. Why do you think he's calling us to pray daily? You know? Why is he calling us to pray daily? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. But uh, one thing is, is as I said before, you cannot think that if you store up a bunch of stuff, that's going to be your answer. In fact, you need to put your trust in God. I'm not saying people can't ever store up, you know, something. Because biblically, I mean, there's a biblical precedence at certain times. And uh, the seven years of famine that was to come, right? First, it was seven years of plenty. And God told Joseph to store up because it would be famine in Egypt. And it was a wise thing to do. In the book of Proverbs, it talks about the wise man, you know, he, he stores up for his children in the future, you see. And it talks about the ant who stores up for winter. So the Bible's not against being practical and using your head. But if you put your trust in anything that you have stored up instead of God, that's where the problem is. You see, that's what people do. They start storing in what they have gotten and get their eyes off of God and think that they are sufficient now. Your life can be gone, as that one man's was. So the, the key is, is that you're, you're depending on God, and you're not panicking, and you're not freaking out, and you're not worrying and, and all these different things, but you're seeking God, and you're trusting Him. That's where your faith comes in. That's where faith comes in, and it's important. In fact, I think it's interesting, because some people feel, oh, tribulation's coming, I've got to have a whole lot stored. You're going to carry it on your back? You know? Jesus said, and when you're in Judea, you know, don't, don't go back to the home and get your things. And the Antichrist, just take off. Well, wait a minute. You're saying he could say, he, but if I don't have anything, what do you mean you don't have anything? You have everything. You have God. Amen? You have the Creator. And then in Revelation 12, after they flee in Judea, then you can compare that with Revelation. And it talks about the woman that goes in the wilderness, and it says that God nourishes her for 42 months. He feeds her. He feeds her for 42 months. Well, Joe, you know what? I've, I've, I've thought this through, and I've, I've got stuff stored up, but it's not at my house. I don't have to go back. And I'm not in Judea. Well, that's true. I've got it stored up where I'm going to go. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Joseph stored up. I don't have a problem with that. Because guess what? I can show you two different paradigms in Scripture. If you feel that God has put it on your heart to store something up to help you get through the tribulation period and you think it's going to happen in your lifetime and you've stored up some food somewhere when if, for if the government gets really corrupt and it's not the tribulation but become a socialistic nation or what have you, or however you do it, I'm not going to judge a person on that because I do see with, you know, the aunt, I see with saving up for the children, I see, uh, you know, with Joseph, I see a paradigm where that can, that can happen to a degree and be biblical. But make sure God's putting it on your heart and it's not because you're panicking or worrying. Because if the motivation is worry or panic, your motivations for doing that are wrong. Because right after Jesus talked about this prayer, give us this day our daily prayer, our, our daily bread, you know what he did? He warned them about worry. He said not to worry like the Gentiles worry. That God clothes the lilies of the field and, and, and he, he, he feeds you know, the birds of the air. And he takes care of them. And he gives a whole long, I mean, a big section of the Sermon Mount is about not worrying. Worry is a sin. Because it's the opposite of faith. You're not trusting God. So if your motivation is, the tribulation is coming, or we're going to become socialists, i got to save up all the other... Wrong. Go to God and say, God, your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. And if God puts it in your heart to do something like that, that's between you and God. What I don't appreciate personally from a biblical standpoint is people that have a one-size-fits-all. You have to go to the Scripture and see there's different paradigms. 
You know, I don't tell everybody, you know, that you, you can't store up. You have to do it this way. You have to pray, give us our daily bread. And you have to, like those in Judea, they go to the mountains and God feeds them for 42 months. You have to do it that way. Because God may lead us somebody differently. You see what I'm saying? So don't, make sure you're not putting what you think's best to do for you on everybody else. I don't do that. You shouldn't do that. But the ultimate thing is whatever you do, you should be trusting God for your daily bread. Whether he, and if you feel he's told you to store something, great. But if he hasn't, don't panic. If you feel he has, don't panic. I simply, at this point in my life, I'm not saying God can't put something on my heart later, but I feel so secure because of my relationship with God and intimacy that we could have with him. I said, pray, give me this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. I personalize it because I'm saying with my personal life, I'm trusting him. But I'm also praying and we're praying for each other. Give us this day our daily bread. So it's real important that you recognize how important that is. Remember Elijah? Do you remember how God fed him? He had crows bring him meat. Do you know how long those crows fed him? Through what period of time? 42 months. 42 months happens to be the exact amount of time as the great tribulation, the last three and a half years when the Antichrist reigns, guys. I don't think that's an accident. And he's running from King Ahab and Jezebel, a picture of the Antichrist and the false prophet. There's a picture of the tribulation there, guys. And God feeds him with crows. I'm looking forward. Part of me wants to go to Judea just so I can split with everybody else and be in the wilderness with the woman and watch God rain manna down, right? And get to know some crows. Hey, thanks, buddy. Can you bring a bigger tri-tip next time? You know, or something like that, you know? So, you know, no, I'll be thankful. But I'm just saying, I'm trusting God. I can't wait. I don't look forward to the trial itself, the pain, but I love to see God's hand. You know, and that's where your faith has to kick in and, and, and worry can go away. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How many, when I talked about the manna, when I talked about Revelation 12, him nourishing us, and Elijah, how your faith grows in God's provisions because we're in the word. That's where we need to be. If you're constantly listening to things that are saying, oh no, oh no, oh no, panicking, and people that don't know God that, are, that recognize some things are going down, and they're always going, oh no, that can breed a sense of worry and panic because they're panicked. You need to make sure you stay in the Word. I'm not saying you can't be informed through different outlets that you've got to make sure they're not unbiblical, and you should be spending more time, all of us, in, in God's Word and meditating on His Word day and night. Amen? In fact, look at how God provided in the book of Exodus when He provided the manna because that was a picture of going into the promised land even as we are now going through the wilderness and the promised land is heaven. It's a picture of us. And Paul said that God fed him with manna. He took care of them. But guess what? He says these were warnings to us that we wouldn't fall like they did because guess what they did? They murmured. They complained against God because they wanted more food and, and what have you. And they didn't trust him. But look at, chat, look at what he does here because it's a picture because it says in Romans 16 these things were also written for our hope, that we might have hope. So God shows us how he takes care of his people in times of famine, in times of when there's not plenty. Look at verse 4, chapter 16, verse 4. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. Notice that? A day's portion, how long? every day. Does that sound familiar? Give us this day our what? Daily bread. And that I may what? That I may test them. They're being tested. You will be tested to put your faith in God. Not how much you could store up. Not that it's wrong to store up. Not to get back into that, but you know what I'm saying. God guides you. That I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. So it's a test. It's a test, you know, and of course, they, they murmured. But why was God testing them? He was testing them to live by faith, to learn to live by faith. Amen? To trust him day by day. That's the test. We need to live by faith and not by what we can do, you see. So, in fact, it's interesting because he wants them to learn the important lesson of faith. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's why we're supposed to be relying on God. Not put faith in government to meet all our needs. Put faith in God to meet our needs. Amen? Because you know what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17? He says to the Jewish people, he says, I'm going to bring you the land of promise. When I get there, don't think when I give you all this wealth, I'm going to give you houses that you didn't build. 
I want to give you land, plenty, a, a land of milk and honey, man. The fruit was huge. He says, when I bring you in there, don't say, look what I have done with my hands. Don't let it go to your head. Don't take your eyes off of me and think, look what I've done with my own strength. Do you understand? You see, so he humbles them for 40 years in the wilderness. They were pretty close to the promised land the whole time. You know that? They wandered because he was training them that he was the provider, that he deserved the glory, that it wasn't going to be about what they could do. He says, I am giving you power to get wealth. Don't abuse it. And many of the Israelites, many of the Jews didn't recognize God, and they've got great power to get wealth. That's still power a lot of Jews have today, no doubt. Man, very skilled. But many of them have forgotten God and, and said, look what I'm doing. But God gave them a blessing as a people to have power to get wealth. Don't misuse it. Same with us. We're the branch we grafted in. He's given us things we don't deserve. And we Gentiles, if you're Gentile or Jew, we've got both in this fellowship, we misuse it. And we think, look what I've done. Look how hard I've worked. Well, I don't need to pray. I did all this work. Give me a break. Did you provide the sunlight that grew, that, that grew the plants that fed the animals you're eating and the, and the vegetation? No. Did you provide the water? Did you provide the soil? You know? Did you? No. You can't even make a, a speck of dust, man. You can't even do that. We don't, it's not our capability as human beings. <sighs> Everything evolved. We can't even make a speck of dust with intelligence, our intelligence. But he's made this intricate system. And we need to depend upon him and realize even if you've worked hard, guess what? He's the one that's giving all this to you. Amen? You've just gone and collected it. You've gone and collected it, just like the manna. And you need to be thankful. And you need to pray, give us this day our daily bread, because he can stop the sun from shining. He can stop the rain from falling. He can allow the soil to be debased. And he does that when people forget God throughout Scripture. When they forget, people forget God, he allows famine, so they recognize who is really in charge. And that's one of the reasons I believe our country is in trouble. Because I believe we are forgetting the one true God. And we're making gods in our own image, these new agey kinds of gods. Well, look at verses 14 and 15. When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was fine, a fine flake-like thing. Fine as the frost on the ground. Wow. When the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? And by the way, manna is the Hebrew for what is it? So when you say, what's manna? The word means, what is it? They've never seen it before. They go out in the morning, it's like, wow, frosty flakes. I mean, they didn't use frosty flakes, but we don't know. It says it tasted like honey. It was like a wafer of honey. Have you ever had, some of you went to Holland, went to a few missionary trips we did to Holland, and you get these little wafers that have honey. You know, that's kind of what I picture manna tasting like. I don't know exactly what it tastes like, but wafers that have kind of a honey in them. You get them in the stores out here now as well. They said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Give us this day our daily bread. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather uh, of it every man as much as he should eat. You shall take an omer a piece according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. The sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much and some gathered little. And when they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he uh, should eat. Moses said to them, Let no man leave it out, or, uh, I'm sorry, let no man leave any of it until morning. In other words, you weren't supposed to get, hoard it, and gather a bunch. <coughs> Excuse me. But they did not listen to Moses, and some of them uh, left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul, and Moses was angry with them. Kind of interesting, huh? It bred worms, it became foul. So if you said, you know what? You know, I don't know about this manna thing. I mean, here it is. And, you know, Moses said this was coming, but, you know, and you're kind of like agnostic or atheistic and you can't explain it. And you try to, well, somehow it evolved from the rocks overnight, you know? But I don't know if it's going to evolve again. And I'm going to gather a bunch. I'm not going to pray. And I'm gonna... Well, guess what, man? You'd wake up in the night and you'd have your, you clutching that, that, you know, manna in your bed and hoarding it and you'd wake up and be full of stench and maggots in your hands because you're filling the test. You're not trusting God to give you this bread every day, you see. And God was teaching them to rely on him every day. To rely on him every day. Amen? So they gathered it, uh, it by morning, uh, morning by morning, every man, uh, as much as he should eat. But when the sun grew hot, it would melt. 
Now on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread. Why do you think they gathered twice as much bread on the sixth day? Sabbath. Not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And check it out. Two omers for each one. When all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, then he said to them, this is what the Lord meant. Tomorrow is a Sabbath. Observance of a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Uh, Bake uh, what you will bake and, and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over put aside and it will be kept until the morning. So they put it aside until morning as Moses had ordered and it did not become foul nor was there any worm in it. Moses said, eat it today for today is the Sabbath of the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it but on the seventh day the Sabbath there will be none. Praise God, man, that God gave Sabbath. You know a lot of cultures they just keep working themselves to death and God gave a day of rest. Now we have the Lord's Day. Not the Sabbath, but the first day of the week that Jesus rose on. But it's kind of cool because on the sixth day, he said to gather twice as much. Now, how many had gathered, because they didn't have faith in God, too much, too many times, and would just wake up with maggots, and now they're like, I'm not gathering twice as much. I know what happens. And then they don't have anything to eat the next day because they still don't have faith. Where everybody else is like, hey, hey, mine. They're like, how'd they do that? You know, no refrigerators. See, that's trusting God. And that's what we're called to do. We need to trust him. We need to live for him. And you know what? We need to apply this more than our physical sustenance. Because the Bible compares God's word to bread. It does. You know, when Satan tempted Jesus and said, turn these stones into bread, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every what? Word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's our spiritual food, God's word. His, and like I love what Jeremiah said. He said, thy word I esteem higher than I do my b- daily bread. You see? And we need to put his word first. And we're called to depend on his word, what? Every day. Meditate on his word, how often? Day and night. I want to thank you for joining us today at Blessed Hope Chapel. We hope you're edified by the service. We're sorry we couldn't bring it to you in its entirety, but you can hear it online in its full content. Uh, Our main hope and prayer for you is that you would know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said, I have come that you might have life more abundantly, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, enter the straight gate, for broad and spacious is the way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. But straight and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Our hope and prayer is that you'd be among those who find it, that you'd find eternal life in Jesus Christ. We thank you again for joining us. Have a beautiful week. God bless you. Till next time.